Okay. Are you ready for me to start yet or not? Yes, we should be good now. Um, mods, uh, keep vetting, um, please, because uh, we do have people waiting. So yeah. Okay, I'm not going to be looking at the the um, Discord screen because I'll be looking at my notes. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, we're, you know, we're going to be in the Q and A after, so yeah. Okay. The the, the talk uh, I'm giving you is one very closely based on one I originally gave in Quito to um, a conference organized by Morales and people. Uh, it was way back. I was, couldn't remember what data i done it, but it turns out I did it way back in 2003. Um, but I think for the things you're interested in, the key points had already been worked out by then. So in this talk, I'm going to be looking at the extent to which computer technology has improved the possibilities for planned economies. Um, and I'm using knowledge that I obtained through both by being a computer scientist and before that by being an economist, um, so that I'm bringing to this both ideas of political economy and ideas of algorithmic complexity. And the things I'm going to be looking at are plans and computers, value and price under socialism, wages, taxes under socialism, and economic direct democracy. Lots of topics there. So they'll all have to be covered at relatively high speed and relatively lightly. Now, what's the historical background to the, the work here? Well, I became interested in this in the late when, when about mid 1980s mid 1980s when uh neil kinnock had taken over the leadership of the labor party and i went to listen to an inaugural speech he was giving um turned out he had lost his voice and he got robin cook who later became foreign secretary to read it for him but what struck me was that Kinnock was justifying abandoning any idea of nationalizing industry uh, and having any idea of planning, but with reference to a recent book that had come out by Alec Nove. Now, Nove was a long standing Western expert on the Soviet Union, and in the past, he'd only ever written on Soviet history. But here he was coming out in the, with this book, um, The Economics of Feasible Socialism, in which he was saying, what are the lessons learned from Soviet experience? And how should it influence future socialist movement? Now, of course, in those days, the Soviet Union was strong, still going. Um, and what struck me was that this book, Nove had written about the Soviet Union was being used to justify a move to the right, even by social democrats within the Labour Party. And I got sufficiently fed up by what I heard um, Neil Kinnock say that I decided to leave the, the Labour Party and join the Communist Party. Now, the context of Nove's work it, itself was. In the longer term, a d debate started by right-wing economists from Austria, particularly von Mises and Hayek. And the Hayekian arguments turned out to be more dangerous to the Soviet Union than Nov's arguments. No one took much notice of Nov in the Soviet Union. He made a, a big political impact on the Labour Party in Britain, but not further afield. Whereas Hayekian ideas had a big impact and Hayekian concepts were applied to shock therapy of, in the Soviet Union or former Soviet Union. They led to the collapse of production and a drastic fall in living standards and life expectancy. Um, my estimates are that you can probably trace 
around 12 million extra deaths in the Soviet Union alone to that. I'm, I recently did some calculations for Ukraine. There's a further 3 million in Ukraine. I haven't looked at um, Kazakhstan and the big uh, ex-Soviet republics. Now, starting with von Mises in the 20s, conservative economists have been arguing that effective socialist economic planning was impossible. And they argued that there were two main reasons for this. One of them is that there was no effective cost metric in the absence of the market. And the other, they said that um, although certain neoclassical economists had argued that in principle it might be possible for a, a socialist planner planning system to use neoclassical economic principles to arrive at an optimal structure of the economy. Uh, this was practically too difficult because the, they would have to solve millions of equations to do this. Von Mises argued that without a market, you couldn't cost things accurately and you had no rational basis for deciding between production alternatives. So, uh, managers in the factory couldn't choose which is the cheapest way of making things. Um, he said, you can't solve this as an engineering problem. It's essentially an economic problem and you need markets, you need price for this. He did, however, make one concession. Uh, he said, well, in principle, if you use the labor theory of value, used labor value, you could have a rational basis for economic calculation. I'll come to this back to this later. But if we turn to the other argument, which is the millions of equations, now it's obviously that that has been radically changed by computer technology. Uh, routinely, computers solve millions of equations. But just saying millions of equations isn't enough. You have to say how many million equations, uh, just how hard are these equations to solve, and how long would it take a computer to do it? In other words, you have to apply algorithmic complexity theory to the problem. Now, the word complexity is used in a number of scientific disciplines, but I'm just focusing at the moment on algorithmic complexity. And we define the complexity of an algorithm in terms of the number of instructions that has to be used to come up with a solution to the problem when that algorithm runs. And the complexity is measured as a function of how that number of instruction grows as the size of the problem grows. And I'll look at a simple example first. I mean, those of you who've done computer science, this will be all old hat. Some of you may not have. So suppose I have a, you will realize this is a rather dated example since no one uses telephone directories anymore. But at the time I gave this lecture, they still exist. A telephone directory was a book which had all the people in the city listed in alphabetical order and their telephone number. And it was quite quick to look people up. Um, let's assume that we, I, I gave in my original example, a telephone directory of the city of Kiev. Now, clearly in principle, I could go through that page by page looking for one particular name until I find it. And that would take me several days, but that wouldn't be an efficient way of doing it. On the other hand, it's the only way to do it if I've got the number and I want to find someone's name. If I've got the number, I have to look at every single number until I come up with it. On the other hand, if I've got the name, I can look up the, the telephone number certainly in 30 to 60 seconds, uh, um, probably less than that. You, you basically open the directory in the middle, see is the, the name beyond where you're looking, look a little bit further, etc., until you very quickly come down to the right page, and then you just scroll down the columns to get to it. And if we want to look up a name in the directory, given the number, that is a job which grows of 
order n. That is to say, if there are a million numbers in the directory, I will on ha average have to look at half a million of them before I find the name. If on the other hand, I want to look up someone's number, the complexity of looking at that up is proportional to the logarithm of the number of names in the directory. Um, so uh, if there are a thousand pages in it, um, when we take the logarithm to the base two, it would take uh, 10 probes to find the right page. And if the pages are then sorted, maybe another 10 glances to find the right name, which uh, is in the order of 20 steps. And that's obviously much better than half a million. Now, the great thing about this is that if I have a, a, a thousand entries or a directory with a million entries, the directory with a million entries only takes twice as long to look up as the directory with a thousand entries. That's a nice property about logarithmic algorithms. Now, that's just the general property of logarithmic algorithms in the first place. Now, let's consider the data that you're working with in planning an economy. It's not a, a telephone directory. Um, in principle, it's a big table, an input-output table, it's called, which has got rows and columns, which says how much uh, oil, coal, iron ore, etc., is used to make steel, how much steel is used to make um, cars, how much um, steel, electricity, etc., is used to make zinc. So every product in the economy, you should, in principle, have a column in this table, and you have all the ingredients in that column and how much of them is used. And that's the basic data structure you're working with. And from an I.O. table, you can compute how much of each intermediate product is required produce, to produce each final product. And in particular, you can compute the labor content of each output. Now, a bit of history here, these input-output tables are now widespread. All major economies publish input-output tables. But the original idea was from a Russian economist, Leontiev, who had been, he moved to the West. But before that, he'd been influenced by the process of constructing the, the data sets required for gospel. So that the, the idea of an input-output table actually derives from the practical experience of planning. Now, Nove in his book claimed that there were 10 million different products in the Soviet Union. Now, if there are 10 million pr products, could we, for example, solve the equations to work out how much labor there is in each? That's 10 million equations. Now, it's very easy to write that down as a formula. I'm not going to read the formula off now, but there's a simple matrix equation formula for it. But if you want to solve it as a matrix equation, you have to invert a matrix. And the matrix that's 10 million by 10 million is just practically too large to store in a computer or to invert. And Nove claimed that it would take thousands of years to construct a complete and balanced plan for the Soviet economy. And that's not implausible if you just look at the number of multiplications, for example, that are required to solve a matrix in inversion. In principle, the, if a matrix has a side of length n, the number of multiplications required to perform a matrix inversion is n to the third power. So that we would be talking about uh, 10 to the 21 multiplications to, to solve the input output table for the Soviet economy, which would take thousands of years. So that, he, he was right there. But 
this is a very naive view of the data. And you'd only say that and pre present these arguments if you were trying in principle to claim that planning was impossible. Because if you approach it as a computer scientist, you immediately see that most of the elements in the table are, are zeros. It's what we call a sparse matrix. And there are various ways of handling sparse matrices, but um, basically you represent them as linked lists rather than as arrays, and you use much less data. The important thing that uh, you have to decide is, on average, how many inputs go to make each output. We say that there is um, 10 million products in the Soviet economy, or there were 10 million products in the Soviet economy. So it was a 10 million by 10 million matrix, but how many of those were zeros? Now, the hypothesis I put forward, or Alan and I put forward when we wrote Towards a New Socialism, was that we reckon the number of non-zero elements in each column of the matrix will be proportional to the logarithm of the number of uh, products. Now, that was a, a, an there. Um, turns out that when I discussed this intuition with graph theorists, they said, oh, that's a well-known result in graph theory, that, that, that uh, for a fully connected graph, you, you expect at least order log n um, node, your fan out for each uh, node in the graph. It's a result of Erdos um, in the, from the 1930s. Or maybe it was a bit later than that. I can't remember when Erdos came up with it. Um, that was an intuition, but I've, I've had a PhD student work on it, and it turns out it's correct that the fan out is of order log n, or in, if, if anything, it's slightly better, less than log n. From that, you can then say that the complexity of solving for labor values for an economy is, in complexity theory terms, n log n, which is a sort of ideal figure for computer scientists. If we find something that's n log n, we reckon that's just about as efficient as you can make it. Um, what it means is that on average, for each product, you only have to look at the labor content of a hundred other products in order to find out what its labor content is going to be. Run, look at 10 million other products. And we only need to know labor values to maybe three significant figures. In prices in a capitalist economy, aren't known even three figures, probably. And you can work this out iteratively. You don't have to use matrix inversion. You just get a first estimate of labor content by initially counting the direct labor that was used in each um, sector. You then, that gives you the first estimate of labor values. You then take a second order estimate by adding in the first order um, labor value of all means of production used up. And that gives you a second order estimate, which is slightly higher than the first order estimate. And you can do second, third order estimates. My experience of using input output tables, if, if you iterate for 10 times, you get perfectly good results. They don't, they don't, they become stationary at that point. And this has drastic results for, in terms of simplifying the problem. It means you could, for the Soviet economy, with a computer of the type that was available when I gave this lecture, with a cheap computer, was, I mean, when I say cheap, I mean three or four thousand pound computer, you could have solved the um, labor values from an economy the size of the Soviet Union in about 600 seconds. It's a big improvement over 3,000 years. It, it demonstrates that the problem is eminently tractable. 
But by itself, that's only half the problem. In Towards a New Socialism, which was written as a, a response to Alec Nove, um, we assumed a feedback mechanism in which sales of products, along with democratically determined general goals, would set net output targets for all uh, goods. And the planning computers then derive the gross output targets required to meet these net outputs. It's an important point about the, US, the USSR economy is that they planned in terms of gross outputs because they weren't, they lacked the easy capability to compute um, gross outputs from net outputs. So instead of planning in terms of net outputs, they planned it in terms of gross outputs. You should plan in terms of net output and derive the gross outputs from that. The model that we proposed in Towards a New Socialism as an alternative to what um, Nove was advocating was drawn uh, on ideas which went back before Marx to those of Robert Owen, which was that you'd have industry publicly owned and planned in physical units. Employees or, or workers would all be paid in labor tokens, one per hour, and goods would be priced in labor tokens proportional to the um, amount of labor required to make. There would be a marketing algorithm that if the plan had got it wrong and stocks of unsold goods of a particular type were rising, then those goods would be sold at a discount below their true labor value for a while. Whereas if the stocks were falling too sharp, they, the goods might be sold at a premium over their labor value. But you'd, the state retailing authorities would be obliged to ensure that the discounts and premiums cancelled out. So total sales were equal to total labor. The planning authorities would look at these deviations of price from value or look at the, the, the data from the stock control system and adjust the plan outputs such that if if stocks if the price of things rise above their labor value they would increase the output for the plan if they fell below labor value they would reduce their output in the plan. now in towards a new socialism we go from discussing complexity of computing labor values to the complexity of computing an optimal plan. And in doing that, we used a technique called the harmony function, which is something which came from neural net theory. And it enables you to, I'm not going to go in, in detail to maths in it, but it enables you to do an iterative technique for the solving of linear, sorry, iterative technique for solving optimal plans for a whole economy run using the technique that Kantorovich developed, which is a linear program, which tends to be of much higher complexity. Uh, if you use the harmony method, you again get a log linear, linear algorithm and the details of the internals of the algorithm needn't worry us here, but if you look at my videos on um, algorithms for planning. I explain the algorithm and have released Java code for it, which people can experiment. Now, why are computers better than the market? Well, the market itself can be viewed as a computing engine. This is quite explicit in Hayek, where he talks about it as being a communications mechanism. He was writing a bit before computers, so he, he treating it as a telephone. But the market has a slow cycle time. It's measured in months or years. It arrives at an answer by physically adjusting the level of production up and down. And it constantly tends to overshoot in an unstable way. And there's a human cost to this. It means uh, poverty and unemployment as industries contract, etc. The point about computers is that they can predict where an ideal market economy would get 
you know, if it ever had the time to stabilize. Of course, it never does stabilize. But it could say, suppose it could stabilize, where would it get? And the computers can work that out. And production can then be adjusted directly to that target. Now, if anyone has read Robert Allen's book, From Farm to Factory, he emphasizes that one of the great advantages in industrialization that the Soviet Union had was that they could simultaneously build up all the industries required to mechanize agriculture. They didn't have to rely on an increase in demand for agricultural products resulting in an increase in demand factors, which then resulted in an increase in demand for machine tools and then an increase in demand for... No. They decided, ab initio, we have to produce more steel, more machine tools, more tractors, and deliver the tractors to the farm. And they could do this investment, even though there were no price signals saying that this would be profitable to because the plan showed you could work out that it was going to be necessary to do that to industrialize the economy. And that was done with paper and pencil planning technique. With uh, computerized planning techniques, the computation time is in the order of hours rather than um, years, which it takes for a capitalist economy to adjust. Now, how do you get democratic choice? We propose a system of online electronic voting. So on key issues, like the proportion of national income to be allocated to health, education, research, etc. And this would be done in posed in terms of the fraction of your working day or fraction of your working week in labor units do you want to allocate to each of these headings? And when such a vote is taken, taxes are then automatically adjusted to the democratic vote on social labor allocation. We assume payment is one hour per hour worked minus taxes, still have to be income tax. People misunderstand what the point that Marx was making in the critique of the Gotha program. Key point he is making is that there's still going to be income tax. There's going, to, there's going to be a deduction from people's wages in order to make um, allowance for socially provided provisions. We argue there shouldn't be differentials to different types of labor. Um, enterprises may be charged more by the state for skilled labor, since the state has, been, has met the cost of educating that labor. But it doesn't mean that the skilled or educated person has to be paid more. This prevents the accumulation of human capital but it's still a uh, makes efficient use of scarce types of labor since the socialist enterprises have to meet the cost of the training and therefore they don't waste uh, highly trained labor. The Soviet system relied heavily on subsidies on, on consumer goods. They subsidized bread, housing, etc., from profits of state industry. Now, this meant that wages in the Soviet Union underestimated the value of labor power. The wage wasn't enough to reproduce labor power. Now, if you undervalue, you reduce the incentive to economize on labor. And this tends to, tended to lead to inefficiency and the hoarding of labor by Soviet enterprises. And over time, meant that their rate of improvement of labor productivity slowed down. And the paying people the full value of their labor makes the subsidies unnecessary because they'll clearly be able to afford to buy the goods if they're paid the full value of their labor. People say that under communism, there'd be no incentive to acquire skills if you paid everyone the same. Well, 
I don't think that's true. I think that there's still an incentive to acquire skills because skilled work is more interesting and enjoyable than unskilled work. That's quite aside from payment considerations. And equal pay is fundamentally democratic. It tells you that all members of society are equally worthwhile to society, equally members of society. The basic ideas that I've been giving in this lecture is a highly condensed version of the what amounts to a political program that we put forward in towards a new socialism. And that's readily available on the web now. And printed paper copies are also available in, in leading languages. And if you go on my current website, which is um, paulcockshop.co.uk, you will find books, articles, talks, etc., building on these ideas. Um, I think I will stop here and start looking at the Discord page to see what questions people are asking. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, for giving that talk, Paul Cockshot. We're going to now transition into um, the Q and A section. So, if you look into the uh, text talk channel, um, you guys can go ahead and start asking your questions. I will um, go ahead and uh, read them off. Um, but before uh, that, I do want to first ask a question for my friend uh, Danoff, um, and he asks. Uh, what do the power requirements, material, logistical, and infrastructural needs look like when automating economies as large as the U.S., China, India, etc.? Are you talking about electrical power? Um, he uh, simply says, uh, I, I suppose, I suppose, yeah, maybe energy, yeah, maybe. Well, I mean, hold on a moment. Uh, let me just go back to the statistics I've got on that. Um, Soviet Union produced 27 gigawatt hours per head uh, of population, I think. Sorry. No, no. Uh, if, if I translate the um, electricity into human labor, and say how many equivalent um, human outputs of labor is given that a, a person working hard generates between 60 and 100 watts of energy. Uh, the, the Soviet Union had uh, 27 mechanical people working for every real person. Uh, the U.S. has 63 in 2014, but the the Soviet uh, figure is well above all, what all other capitalist countries have even now. So, in terms of the power requirements, how to say the the level of 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 electrical power that the Soviet Union installed is almost certainly enough. You might need a bit more for the um, running the, the computer systems, but they're not that demanding on power. Um, because if we look at uh, Great Britain in 2014, they had the equivalent of 24 people per, per in electricity for each worker. Um, and they had a lot more computing facilities in 2014 than the Soviet Union had in 1990. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Um, now, Finbol wants to ask a question, so you can go ahead. Finbol. I would like to know how um, how do you think we should transition from capitalism to the type of socialism that you are describing? Um, I know that's a really broad question, but in terms of uh, economics, you want to, to abolish money as soon as possible, I think. Yes. And uh, deal with the fact that in different countries you have drastically different 
labor productivity. So that's the economic question I have. Is is this supposed to be a system that can only work on a global scale or can it work in individual no, countries? We've got, we've got to do it on, on, on the countries where as you come as uh, socialist governments come to power in individual countries. It it's a terrible mistake to say that you've got to postpone everything until it can be done on a world scale. That that uh um, so is, is it, is it, into the future. do you have to have some kind of transition phase in individual countries and then you can yes. uh, okay and transition phase in individual countries to abolishing um, money would be to first tie explicitly tie the unit of currency to the labor hour you might do this by for instance over printing euro notes so that each um, euro note said uh i can't get the i think it's about two minutes or something like that okay so or a 10 euro note would be uh, overprinted as being 20 minutes that's roughly right for a euro so that the actual value of money gets fixed in terms of time but it circulates as notes okay so that uh, people can see that there's exploitation going on because they see that uh, if they work 20 minutes they don't actually get 10 euro so it, it that that uh unmasks the basic exploitation relation um it, there's a remark in um anti during where Engel says that printing on banknotes, the amount of time they embodied, would be illegal under Bismarck's anti-socialist laws because it would amount to um, agitation for the expropriation of the capitalist class. So it, a socialist government should do this straight away as an education step to show people how exploited they are should then transfer all rights to the value created in all firms to the workers in those firms. So that the next stage is that the, the workers actually have the right to the hours that they contribute. Now, at this stage, it's still money. It's money marked in labor hours, but the Individual firms won't necessarily get back exactly the number of hours they put in because of the fluctuations of a market economy. And you can't actually move to a stage of abolishing money unless you do two. One of them is to ban the transfer of labor accounts between private individuals. Once you ban the transfer between private individuals, you prevent one person being able to employ. Uh, but to do that, you actually need a, a technology. And the technology is there now in the form of uh, electronic payment cards. So you'd, you'd withdraw the notes from circulation and you'd have payment in terms of outing the electronic payment system which already exists and at this point there's no antagonistic relation between the different units of production which all work at home to prevent them being brought into a coordinated social plan but you have to do it through a series of stages each of which can work on its own account and not cause the economy to collapse Sorry, there are masses and masses of questions. I, I it hadn't realized it, it scrolled yet. Okay, here we go. So, um, so uh, I have no idea how to read that name, but UCICUYH asks, how does AI play into future computational socialist planning? I, I, at the moment, I don't think it's necessary to, to use much in the way of AI. I think it's uh, the the issues can be solved um, classic 
algorithmic mathematics. I don't think they need uh, need AI. All righty. Um, four eight six seven eight nine four. Are you ready to ask your question? Hello, Paul. Hi. So my question is about human nature. I had a, a friend today, and we had an interesting conversation about uh, Marxism, socialism, and human nature. He agreed that we could solve most of the world's problems logistically, but disagreed on the fact of human nature, even after I pointed out the fact that humans have millions of years have been collective societies. He said that we have to establish leadership roles and then the entire fact of how we stopped being collectivist societies shows against the million, like the thousand year arg argument. So I just want to hear your thoughts about human nature and its role with socialism. Well, at one level, you can say that what we take to be human nature is heavily conditioned by the society that we grow up in and the ideas and values that that society has. On the other hand, there is some thing which you have to take into account that you, you mustn't have a social system with a series of perverse incentives that uh, incentivize people to do antisocial activities. So um, you can't rely on just uh, morality and goodness uh, leading people to do things. You have to have systems of incentives which fit with uh, what you want done. Now, I would argue that paying people the full value of their labor gives you a much greater uh, incentive to uh, contribute to society than if you're being exploited and any ex extra effort you you put in goes to the benefit of the company you're employed by um, if you were to strictly take a you know, human nature approach you'd have to say that uh, the, the 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 system in a capitalist economy is so contrary to human nature that it's bound to fail. And in fact, if you read Braverman's Labour and Monopoly Capital, you see that capitalists have had to go to huge lengths to ensure that production does take place against the perverse incentives that uh, capitalism gives the exploited not to work and not to, to produce the output that's required so i i think you, you can turn the argument on human nature the other way around and illustrate that in fact the the incentive system of capitalism is so contrary to to human nature that it can only be kept going by coercive means all right thank you all right, so Finball has um, completed writing his uh, question, so I'm going to just read that for him now. Um, he said, he said uh, you want to implement a system of direct electronic democracy. Is this something that can be Im implemented right away, or do we need some kind of lower stage first? What about poor third world countries? How high of a standard of education of the population okay. do we need in order to abolish representative democracy and how highly developed does the economy need to be in order to implement electronic voting? <clears throat> the, we, we've looked at both these issues, uh, but there are two aspects to the program we're advocating on direct democracy. One aspect is plebiscites, which uh, when we were putting this in 1989 or so was not something the left was willing to countenance but if you look at the the movement of the yellow jackets in france you have a mass movement there whose key demand actually is for direct democracy or rule by plebiscite and for the citizens to be able to advance uh motions to be put to the vote now can it be done with low tech 
yes, the the handy vote system that we demonstrated uh, and ran a prototype of was so designed that you could do it even with feature phones. You don't need smartphones. You could just use your most basic Nokia phone with text message to 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 do it. Um, and it, it, we specifically looked at, I've had students look at the technology available in India, and we request technology than the electronic voting system that Indian elections currently use. So one of the aspects of what we're saying was uh, plebiscites, electronic plebiscites. The other is representative bodies be drawn by lot from the working population rather than elected. And that, again, is something that can be done immediately. It doesn't require any special technology. Um, drawing lots is a simple procedure. Um, it can be done to form councils at any level. And it prevents the formation of a bureaucratic ruling elite or class. Doesn't require sophisticated technology at all. It's readily comprehensible by everyone. All right. Um, now that Finbull is done, uh, Aztec would like to ask a question, so go ahead, uh, Mayan. All right. Hello, Mr. Um, my name is Aztec, a.k.a. Mayan, and I wanted to ask you, um, you made a video, I think it was one of your first ones, where it was why you, why basic income is a bad idea, and I want, I tend to agree that the UBI itself doesn't really attribute the contradictions of capitalism, or, and it just, and it just, just contributes to the, it contributes and subsidizes low uh, skilled work. I just wanted to ask you, not low skilled work, low paid work. Oh, sorry about that. Low paid work. And I just wanted to ask you, since this climate of everyone buying into Andrew Yang's UBI policy and everyone just buying into UBI, I wanted to ask you if there, if you wanted to update your video on why or your idea on why basic income is a bad idea, or just. Anything to add on to why you think a bad idea? It might be worth it. Um, I, I, I'm not short of people giving me suggestions of uh, things to produce videos on. Um, the, the the one I did was based on data that had been um, put forward by the Green Party in Scotland, and it was associated with the last election in Scotland, so that it was specifically to to counter that um, and to counter the influence that the Green Party's ideas were having within the party I was in myself. Um, it's, it's no surprise that a, a, a capitalist like Yang should advocate that kind of policy. It's, an, it's a far-right policy that was developed by Friedman and Hayek, the, the, the people that uh, brought you Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan. Um, so that it should be being brought forward at a time when there's the starting of a social democratic movement in um, the United States as a way of diverting attention from that is not surprising. It, I mean, it is and always has been a, po a policy of the far right. Well, thank you. That's all I wanted to hear. Um, so real quick, uh, I'm going to, before I get to the next person online, I want to ask this question that I actually, I was planning to ask, but, uh, Koba already beat me to it. So I'm just going to read off Koba's question. Uh, why do you think socialist nations past and present have not yet used computerized central planning large scale? Could such a system have prevented the economies of Cuba and the DPRK from crashing after the fall of the USSR? It would certainly have made things could have helped them. Um, Part of the problem was you actually need an indigenous capability to produce the requisite level of computer technology. And although I'm talking about um, relatively fast compute times, these are relatively fast compute times if you have computers available with 
of the order of a gigabyte of memory. And failing that, large disk drives. Um, now, one of the things that the Americans did was put strong sanctions on the export of computer equipment to the socialist countries. Um, and even in the West, the ability to store the amount of data required for this kind of planning didn't really exist until large disk drives were mass produced and commercially available in the 1970s. So it wasn't possible in the 60s. In the West, you had the disk storage technology in the, in the 70s. By the end of the 70s, with Cray supercomputers, you had the computing capacity. But uh, you didn't have that storage capacity and computing capacity in the Soviet Union. Uh, they didn't actually have that uh, technology. They could have developed it if they decided to, but they didn't give the priority to it. On the other hand, China certainly has the technology. It has the, the, the indigenous computer capacity. And you have this paradox that Jack Ma, who is actually a billionaire, but it's a member of the Communist Party, was proposing to do more or less that a year or so ago, um, because he knows that China has the capacity to do that. But uh, it's been squashed down, that proposal, as far as I can see. Um, so partly there's a technical issue, but partly there is also a political issue. You can see within China now, the um, national bourgeoisie who are tolerated and have within the, the country and have significant political influence are, are not going to like such a system. And their voice within the Communist Party is quite significant and they will be blocking. But even if you go to the USSR, uh, where there was no national bourgeoisie of that type, um, this type of system does involve some fairly dramatic changes to the way, for example, the relationship between men and women. If you pay everyone equally hour, or within each trade, if each trade has an equal hourly rate, then entrenched differences between different branches of labor, between ones which are predominantly male and predominantly female, would be eliminated. And th there is, you have to take into account the very strong prejudice which still, which certainly exists very strongly in the West, but it was developing in the latter years of the Soviet Union, whereby the intelligentsia thought they were better than the working class and thought they were actually entitled to have a bigger differential from the working class. And therefore, any reform proposal which reduced their differential is, is not going to be accepted. All right, thank you very much. Um, the next question would be, <clears throat> um, Carton, uh, would you like to read your own question or would you like me to read your question for you? All right, I'll unmute you then. Where is, uh, okay, go ahead. Uh, all right. So, what's about like if talking ab about late stage uh, socialism and agricultural automat automatization and central planning in, ag in agriculture by itself? We would like stuck on a gas, a gas like or cyber scene like systems, or can it be like pushed even even much further, like to extent of minimal human input needed for any kind of planning in agriculture? I think. I mean, if they had pushed ahead with OGAS um, and the uh, um, the ideas that Grushkov had in the in the 60s and carried out the level of investment required, 
I think the Soviet economy could have been saved. Uh, but that's water under the bridge now. All righty. Um, next is uh, um, one second. Let me just move that pen. Um, all right. Next is a question uh, by um, 19th century Jewish dude. Uh, would you like to ask the question yourself, or would you like me to do it for you? All right. Um, so. Uh, he asks, what part does workers' self-management of industries, worker cooperatives, and or collective bargaining has within your political program? It seems you utilize the, critique of the, uh, utilize the critique of the Gotha program to orient yourself in regards to creating a national income reserve. However, the same text which speaks of bourgeois right as persistent to the val uh, valorization of work itself. So why do you think within the transition to communism there should be no qualitative differentiations between labor? It it what Marx talks about is difference in pay due to actual effort and act production done, and that was the principle that was employed in the Soviet Union and under in terms of Stakhanovism that uh, people were paid according to the labor they actually. And I see no objection to that, uh, where there's a difference in an objectively measurable difference in output. You can you can determine the norm, what the the average worker does, uh, or they called it the norm in the USSR, and the norm gets an hour per hour. If someone produces twenty percent above the norm, then they can get twenty percent more. Uh, now, because it's a norm, because it's an average, these things average out in the wash. So that that difference is one that uh, Marx recognizes in the Critique of the Gotha Program, and that the Soviet Union did explicitly recognize and implement. I mean, I was quite surprised visiting Bulgaria in the early 1980s to discover that another computer academic who who I had met who worked in Bulgaria got paid extra per amount of lecture notes he handed out to his students per the amount of slides he produced every measurable output that he did was recognized as labor and um, contributed to the to his pay so that the that uh, principle is not one that goes against what Marx is saying. That that is a fairly realistic implementation of what he was talking about. But a difference between two entirely different trades, uh, between uh, being a doctor and being um, a shop worker, well. There's no way you can compare the productivity of those two. And uh, if, if one person works longer hours or has to work, um, you know, night duty because they're a doctor, obviously you get paid more for that. But uh, the hourly rate, there's no reason why a doctor should be paid more than a, a, a shop worker. Unless you can objectively measure the intensity of the work that they're doing and say, okay, objectively, this is actually more intense labor. All right, thank you. Um, so the next question is by uh, Juche Gang, and he asks, um, he says, hi, Paul, my question is, how would an AI planned economy determine creative value? For example, a really bad song that someone only spent an hour on versus a great song that someone spent two weeks on. Well, the you, you're assuming there that um, there is still private property in, in intellectual products, that people still uh, collect royalties on them. Whereas the 
assumption in a socialist economy is that information is either unowned or collectively owned. And that includes the information of, of music. So that uh, any uh, body is entitled to, to any orchestra is entitled to play that symphony. Uh, whether they choose to play his ones or another one would depend on the quality of them. And the people who were professional musicians or professional writers were paid a salary um, but for what they're doing. And you, you can have some method of seeing whether are they productive, do they produce dross, or do they produce good quality stuff. If they're not producing good quality stuff, well, they, they can get redeployed to, to some other branch of labor. It's easy enough to, with modern technology to see whether uh, it is good quality stuff because assuming that you can download any music for free, you can still collect the statistics on which music gets downloaded. But you don't uh, pay people uh, millions if millions of copies of their music get downloaded. You, they, they get paid a salary. And if they're not productive enough, they have to do it as um, as amateurs, not paid full time. All right. Anyone still there? Yeah. Yes. yeah. Um, and uh, next question would be, uh, who who is next in line? It's kind of hard to tell with these pins. All right, I'll do garlics. Um, I'll do jacks after garlics. Uh, anyway, so garlic Soviet asks, uh, do you think that Kazakhstan reform or another kind of economic decentralization reform was inevitable due to the economy becoming more complicated without computerization being available? And if yes, would you say that a different kind of economic reform would be a better choice? And then he says in parentheses, what I think of... What I think of is letting small market sector exist without decentralizing the state enterprises. No, I, I don't think you, you, you needed to, you, 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 you wouldn't have needed to shift to a completely com detailed computerized planning system. There are intermediate reforms they could have carried out involving shifting to labor value accounting. Um, you can achieve the labor value accounting um, less accurately but still in a functional way um, using networks of low, low tech computers i mean at the time we are talking about it um we actually when we wrote the book in in the 1980s we we came up with solutions for how you could do it using you know eight bit mini computers uh, it wouldn't be as fast as the supercomputer tech, uh, but using a mi mixture of 8-bit mini computers and uh, spare bandwidth on TV channels, we showed you could do it. All that was that kind of stuff was well within the capability of the Soviet Union. All right. It was a political issue. The, the primary issue was political. The the, the there was not a different Marxist program being advanced uh, for restructuring the co the economy. The only program that was actually being put forward was that of the neoliberals, and the people who were pro-socialist were not actually putting forward a program of their own. All right. Um, so next, uh, is Jack, uh, Jack, would you like to ask your question yourself or would you, um, oh, hello? Hi. Uh, hi, professor. Uh, my question is how would, uh, resources be allocated to, uh, the arts and, uh, move media and so forth? Uh, would they be allocated as just part of the, uh, quote unquote budget of the, uh, country? Or it, could... it, this is the general point. If you make information free, okay, um, whether that information is scientific information 
or it is our, um, literary information, or it's images, then the people who produce that information have to be supported in some way. And they are supported out of the labor of the rest of society. So the rest of society has to vote on how, how many um, hours or minutes a week they're willing to, to have deducted from their labor product to support arts and sciences. Although that has to be a voluntary contribution by the working class to support. Okay. Um, in relation to that, would the uh, uh, would there then be a way of the uh, constituents uh, who are uh, paying into that vote on which projects uh, would get more resources? It becomes too difficult if you it require the whole population to decide on details. You you have to assume that there there will be arts councils that uh, hand the funds out, but these arts councils have to have uh, working class representation on them, uh, and making up at least the majority of the the council that hands out the money, uh, not money, but hands out the um, full time places in in various artistic activities. All right, thank you, Professor. Not Blashi um, asks, how would a centrally planned econ uh, sorry centrally planned system of one country fight off capital encirclement, specifically with regards to cyber warfare and sabotage of computerized protocols? Okay, what I'm pro proposing for that is a, that you have every computer. This is qu quite set my um, computer science papers on this, but that e each computer have its own unique instruction set so that uh, no two computers run the same instruction set at the binary level and therefore viruses can't target individual computers. Viruses depend on there being a small number of instruction set architectures in the world at the moment. There's basically ARM architectures and there's Intel architectures. And you can therefore have binary exploits which make use of these binary opcodes of being in common. If you uh, design a processor which has a, a permutation unit on its um, opcode input, uh, channel so that the actual binary instructions are different on every processor you you get for example you get two, 256 factorial different instruction sets quite simply and we have designed protocols for the dissemination of the software to make them immune to that kind of attack if you look at the talks I've, uh, on the website on making computers immune to Vault 7 attacks. That, that's what I'm recommending. As an engineer, I think of these things as try and come up with an engineering solution. Necrominist asks, um, sorry, Necrominist asks, um, I am a computer science student in my second year. Information systems and programming are of great interest to me, and I hope to extend my study to do a master's degree and possibly a PhD. Is there any advice you would share for someone who wishes to take this path, and what opportunities does it lead to? Yeah. Um, I would say if you're going to do that kind of thing, make sure you're grounding in the material the sort of material basis of computing is understand what the actual hardware does. Uh, don't just approach it from the standpoint of the abstractions you're given in programming languages. Train yourself so that you can both design hardware and software. Make sure that you attend any of the hardware modules you're offered and don't don't limit yourself just to understanding software. That, that, that's the key advice I would give, because there are some problems which are much better solved 
by coming up with a hardware solution than a software solution. All right. Um, the next question uh, will be Vincer Vincetamos Allende's uh, question, and uh, he wants to read it himself. So um, let me find him. Here we go. Um, go ahead. Hello, Allende. Hi. Oh, yeah. Now, um, in your lecture, you mentioned the ban of personal transactions between people. Wouldn't a ban like this anger many people, at least in the West? What do we do with petty bourgeois property, small businesses, etc.? To the extent that you can't um, initially get rid of certain trades that carried out, there are, there are two broad ways you can deal with this. One of them is to say that, all, for instance, all plumbers must belong to a plumbers union and um, payments are made to the plumbers union and the plumber, plumbers union then keeps them, uh, makes payments to The other is possibly uh, you could allow someone who is registered as a full-time tradesperson to, to have an account into which payments could be made, but set a limit of the amount of credits that can go into it equal to the legal limit of the working week. So if the legal limited of the working week is 35 hours. They can't get more than 35 hours of credit paid into it. The software prevents more than that. Thank you. Which essentially prevents them actually engaging, employing the labor of others. All righty, thank you for that question. Um, next we have um, Mal Penn, would you like to read your own question or would you like me to read it for you? Can you hear me now? Yes. I can hear you, yes. All right, so what are your thoughts on Project CyberSim in uh, Allende's Chile? I think it's a, a very um, forward-looking project. Um, you have to recognize that it's not quite the same type of cybernetics as what I'm talking about or that the uh, Soviet people were talking about. Um, Beer's cybernetic proposals come along the the line from Viner and the cybernetics that was developed for military command and control. Uh, cybernetics in the West ro rose from Norbert Viner's work, who was working uh, anti-aircraft gunnery control systems in the, first, in the Second World War. And you have to understand the CyberSim system as being informed by military command and control theory. And it's like command room for an air defense system or the, or the command room for a military unit. And its aim is to deal with immediate emergencies and act on those. Um, now, there's a, there was a considerable similarity between military command and control and the way the Soviet planning system worked in the first two five-year plans, for example. It, it, there, there is a, uh, a relationship between them. And in a relatively low co complexity economy, that kind of military command control system is very useful. And it may still be needed in, in more sophisticated economies, I'm not sure. But um, And it, it, you've got to take into account Chile was a much smaller country than the Soviet Union, a much simpler economy. So that type of uh, system was probably adequate and well adapted to what uh, they were attempting to do. All right. So um, that'll be all then. Uh, everybody, please uh, give a, a big thank just, you. Just to... a few bits of information. If people do want to contact uh, up to some level, Limit, I can answer questions on Facebook. If you contact me on Facebook, I, I can respond. Uh, and obviously, as I've said before, most of my publications are available online. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cockshot, for coming and doing this talk for us. Everybody, please give him a big thank you in the chat. Um, okay. It's been nice to, to, to have a chance to talk to people.
Uh, I really appreciate um, you coming here and, uh, you know, uh, giving this community the opportunity to uh, hear um, you speak. So, uh, yeah, thanks a lot. And um, if that'll be all, uh, everybody can go ahead and clear out now. Okay. Bye for now. Goodbye. Thank you for the lecture. Thank you.